Well, thanks very much for um, inviting me here today. Um, I've heard great things about this club. I've spoken at a couple um, writers' clubs around Southern California. This is, this is um, living up to its billing as one of the biggest and most active groups. So it's, it's always great to see that. Um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about my, my writer's journey and specifically on uh, writing outside your comfort zone, um, which I'll get to in a minute. But um, one of the things that you always hear, is, especially as a beginning writer, is that old saw, write what you know. I'm sure everybody's heard that. And of course, there is some truth in that. Um, you know, you, you, it makes sense to write what you, you know about, some things that you've lived through. Uh, and it is easier. I've done both, which I'll talk about. Um, writing about a world that I, I don't know and writing about something that I lived through. And it is easier to write about something that you, you've lived through or know or what have you. But, you, but that doesn't mean to say that you can't go beyond your comfort zone or your, or, um, your, your world to write about other things. I mean, when you think about it, think of all the movies, the books, the TV shows that we would not have if writers only wrote about what they knew. Uh, I can guarantee you that writers in the writer's room and on Law and Order, probably none of them are lawyers. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that Julian Flynn did not plot to murder her husband. But she wrote about it and made it, you know, it was a great story. Um, and, and we cannot all be Ernest Hemingway's having these super groovy experiences fighting fascists in Spain, you know, reeling in marlins off the coast of Cuba. Uh, trekking up Mount Kilimanjaro to, to base our, our novels on. So, you know, most of us live in, in fairly sort of small or well-defined orbits in our lives um, that are sort of tracked from early on. Uh, and we surround ourselves with like people, people like us. So, but you have to at some point as a writer um, move beyond that. Uh, you know, some people don't. Uh, John Grisham's a great example. He, um, you know, wrote a uh, lawyer wrote, a book, wrote legal thrillers and made you know best-selling career out of that. But even he now writes you know things that are not based in a, in a law firm. And I don't know you know maybe he ran out of steam, he, he ran out of uh, thoughts, or he just got bored. Which uh, you know I don't blame him because you know you write the same thing over and over again with with various you know some variation, but it's basically the same thing. And I think as writers, we're, we have a natural curiosity about the world, about human nature. You know, we want to explore that. That's the purpose of writing and the purpose of fiction and nonfiction. Um, to me, that, you know, that's what I love to, to do. To me, it's, it's about, you know, it's driven by my curiosity about the world, whether it was about, you know, journalism or, you know, fiction writing that I do today. Um, so, but writing what you know is obviously a great starting point for, um, for, for writers. And that's why you often get novelists who start with that autobiographical novel and then they, they move on. Uh, me, I did it kind of backwards, you know, the nonconformist that I am. I ended up writing about what I didn't know first, and then my second book, um, which was Skin of Tattoos, my second book was uh, Girl on the Brink, which was once something I lived through, which was an abusive relationship. And I ended up writing about that because I, I thought it was important to write about that as sort of a cautionary tale, if you will. Um, and I said it as a, I made a young adult novel um, also, but I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But, um, and it was easier. When I finally got to writing Girl in the Brink, I'm like, oh, this is so much easier <laughs> writing about, you know, something I lived through. I didn't have to really strain, and I, you know, my confidence level was, was better, you know. But that doesn't mean to say you can't write convincingly about something that you don't, uh, you don't know. Um, so I say, write about what you're drawn to. Write about what you have a passion for, uh, what you have a natural inclination toward. And it can be something that, um, you know, maybe completely out of your field of, of work or your everyday life, but you just have an interest in it. Maybe you're just interested in Africa, maybe, you know, Middle East uh, politics, whatever it is. You know, because that will, will A, it will aid you in your research, because you'll be more inclined to really dive in and really, you know, sort of shake the trees to get all you can out of it. But importantly, it will show through in your writing. It'll just show through that passion for your subject. 
So, you know, so that's my, my one thing is just write about, so when people say write about what you know, I say write about what you have a passion for, and that will really um, come through. And then, of course, when, as writers, we have fertile imaginations, um, and we have a lot of intuition, and then you add that to the mix. Uh, so I, I um, you know, it, it all comes together, I think, in the in the writer's brain, and that there's somehow a magical process that we, you know, come from our imagination out onto to the paper. Um, so here's, a, you know, a case in point. I went skydiving um, some years ago. I don't know what possessed me to do that, but I did. Went out to Riverside County to Paris, where they have that big skydiving place. And I did it. I jumped out of the plane at 13,000 feet. Um, but anyway, the guy was telling me, oh, you know, about, a little bit about the skydiving world. You know, there's a lot of alpha males, you know, a lot of alpha female, big egos, rivalry, jealousy, competition. So on the way back, driving back to LA, and uh, you know, after recovering from my you know, <laughs> jump out of 13,000 feet, wow, that's a really great world to set maybe a romance in, or a mystery story, you know, these, you know, it's just fodder. I just thought, wow, I could see a story that, and I haven't seen a lot about, you know, set in a world of skydiving. I'm like, yeah, I could really write that. And I'm thinking, eh, you know, I, I, I wasn't really into skydiving. I thought, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I did it once, and what would I have to do? I'd have to learn all about skydiving. I'd probably have to like, go hang out with skydivers, maybe date a skydiver, you know. And I just, you know, it just didn't really trip my triggers. I'm like, eh, I, you know, push that aside. But I still think it would make a great story. So if anybody wants that idea, run with it. Um, but uh, you know, you don't see a lot, and that's sometimes you always have to look for things that aren't overly written about. You know, find little corners of society. So, but the thing I did get interested in uh, many years ago was gangs. And I'll tell you the story behind that because people look at me and they say, "How did you, you, get into gangs? You know, why are you about gangs?" So uh, many years ago, I was working at a newspaper in Trenton, New Jersey, the Trenton Times, and I got assigned um, a story to do a story on the Hells Angels who were doing this Christmas run. They gathered toys and they would go on their Harleys out to a children's hospital, I think in Philadelphia it was. And so I got, you know, so they said, oh, Christina, go cover this thing, go talk to these guys. So I'm like, hmm, okay, this is, is going to be pretty cool, Hells Angels, you know. So off I go to Levittown, Pennsylvania, which is Trenton's right on the Delaware River, which is the border between New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So I cross the bridge to go to Levittown, which is kind of a working class suburb with little houses, and pull up, and there they were, you know, all the hopping Harleys gleaming in the driveway. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. It's very Sons of Anarchy ish, actually. <laughs> you know, I know that show. Then I think back on it. You know, and open the, you know, knock on the door, and there's, you know, the guy opens it, and he's got the hair, you know, the beard, and he's in black leather, and the jeans hanging out of his, his, his jeans, and I'm sitting in the kitchen, and I, so I interviewed these guys, and it was pretty interesting, and I thought, wow, you know, here's these, um, you know, they're kind of like normal guys, and, and I, so I asked them about the toy thing, and then I branched off into how they live, and I just thought, you know, wow, well, this is really interesting how people form these little societies within a society. It was like a little microcosm. They had their own way of dress, their own lingo, their own rules, their own, you know, thing, transportation, obviously, the, the motorcycles. Um, and yet they sort of lived in this suburban little house, or I don't know whose house it was, but anyway, they hung out at this house. So I was like sort of interested with it became interested. So I go back to the newsroom, write up my story. Love, the editor loved the story. They stick it on the front page, below the fold, and the picture of the guys with their, their Harleys. Next day, next morning, you know, before I even got out of bed, I get this phone call, and it's the editor at the newsroom saying, Fat Hell's Angel, he's calling up, yelling about your story. He doesn't, you know, he's screaming about, why did you put all this stuff in the story? And I don't know. God, you know, now I run to my window and I'm looking out and you know, like, out of my where I live. You know, I'm like, oh God, I really didn't want to go to work. Of course, I had to. So, you know, it sort of blew over. Nothing, nothing happened. But I was like, oh. It also may have influenced that when I called the hospital to get a comment, you know, um, about the this angels' toy run. You know, the guy's like, oh. 
you know, we appreciate the effort, but we really don't want anything to do with the Hell's Angels, you know. <laughs> I wish they wouldn't do it. So I put that in the store, you know, that was the comment. So I put that in the store. They probably didn't like that either. But anyway, but it really was a bad story. I, I think I just put more detail in it than they had expected. I didn't say anything negative about them. But anyway, they didn't like it. Those guys keep a low, tend to keep a low profile. But they did, you know, stick their neck up to the first story about this. So I became very interested in, in just how people form these little societies. Oh, the epilogue, I should tell you the epilogue to that story. A couple years later, I was, um, I had to interview a, an inmate, a prison inmate in South Jersey, Leesburg State Prison. So the easiest way to do that was he just put me on his visit list. It was very easy, it's very easy in New Jersey, it's much more difficult here in California, but he just put me on my prison list and I showed up at the prison the next Sunday when he was a regular visitor. And I brought him some food, because you could take the food into the visit room, which I'm very glad I did. So who's there on the other side of the visiting room? But one of the angels. And I'm like, and I recognized him, I thought, oh, hopefully you won't you know, see me, you won't recognize me. I tell my guy, and he's like, oh, yeah, there's a couple of those dudes in here, you know. So I move the chair, so I'm sitting with my back to him. You know, do you talk to, talk to the guy, get my information, and you know, beat it out of there, because I did not want to run into the angel in the, in the parking lot. And so nothing happened, but he did see me. Uh, you know, a couple days later, the, the biker inmate says to my inmate, who was that visit you had in there? You know, who's that girl? She a reporter. He's like, no, no, she's not a reporter. I'm like, oh, good. Glad I brought him the food, you know, and get him on my side. But anyway, that was the little epilogue to that story. Um, so, but it wasn't the first time I've gotten in trouble for, for writing, writing stuff about people. But, um, but that's what I, I became interested in, yeah, how people just form these little societies within larger society and what drives that. So, um, many years later, I was assigned to do a, a magazine story in El Salvador about, this was about 2000, I guess, um, about um, homeboys, about, about gang members deported from Los Angeles to El Salvador after getting caught, you know, with a criminal record. Mm -hmm. um, many of them had uh, either been, there either, some of them were legal, but some of them had permanent residency. Uh, many of them had permanent residency, and they got stripped of that because they got convicted of a crime and kicked out. So I was there in, in, in San Salvador, and I found the guys, and uh, so I did a big story on them, and it just really, and again, going beyond the um, sort of the headlines, the, the image, when you talk to people, I found that they were very, really sort of just like scared kids, you know, or young adults. And it was just really interesting, and it just really moved, they were, you know, totally bewildered by this turn that their life had taken by being deported, they had grown, they, some of them barely spoke Spanish, you know, they missed the United States, that was their home, you know, they wanted to go to the shopping mall and all this stuff, and, but they were trying to, struggling to make their lives there in El Salvador because they could never come back here. So it just stayed with me. And, um, you know, in journalism, you write facts. And, you know, it's black and white, you know, this happened, that happened, he said, she said, um, you know, it's very much sort of a black and white recitation of the facts. And when I started to write fiction, you know, you write truth. You write, the f you, you can write the facts, but you write the nuance, the context, the, the backgrounds um, of things. And that's what I wanted to write with Skin of Tattoos. It just really stuck with me, that story. But I didn't get to it for many years. I, um, after I left, I was in Latin America for about 10 years as a foreign correspondent doing all kinds of, of stories. And I ended up back in Miami working for the Miami Herald. And I, one day I just sat down and I just wrote a whole sort of outline. I think it was a 10-page outline for that um, gang story. And I just put it away. You know, I was in Miami. I didn't know, you know what I was going to do with it or whatever. Lo and behold, I end up in L.A. Um, 2000, what was it, seven? And um, I'm working for the Associated Press, and I, my, my beat was urban affairs. So I covered a lot of poverty issues. I was down in Skid Row. I was out on the street, you know. Um, it was the time of the mortgage crisis, how that affected poor people. And I did a lot of gang stuff, you know, gang intervention and prevention. 
you know, this is the, the gang capital of the, of the nation. And so I pulled out that old outline. I thought, well, maybe it was sort of meant to be. And I started working on, on the, that story. But I still had to do a lot of research. Even though I, you know, I interviewed some gang members, some people, you know, a lot of people who worked with them. So, but you still, you know, in a, in a novel, you really have to, to fill in the frame. You have to fill in a lot of different picture, little <coughs> details and, and picture, you know, create that visual picture with your words. So here's some of the things I did. And it, it took me a long time to finish the novel because I kept losing, ah, I'm not going to do this. And I put it down and then I pick it up and then I put it down. And finally, um, in a writer's workshop, after a writer's workshop, a, a writer, um, one of my friends said to me, oh, what happened, Christine, what ever happened to that, that homeboy story you were doing? That was really good. And I'm like, oh, well, she thought it was good, and, you know, I picked it up again, and I finally finished it. But it took, it took me a long time to kind of get it all together. But here are some of the things how I, I sort of used to paint the, that world to get into it. Number one, I was kind of, I was interested in it. You know, I, had, I was fascinated by it. Um, and the more I delved into it, the more I just thought it was just really interesting how people, how kids got into that, changed the course of their lives of, of diff in different, many different ways um, and things. So one of the things um, I found was really useful was YouTube. And that was, a, you know, I hadn't thought of that as a source, as a research tool, but it's really got some great stuff on it. You can find videos on there, um, just pretty much everything. I mean, anything and everything. It's all up on YouTube, and I really had no idea until my son got into it, and he was anything he would, yeah, he'd look it up on YouTube. And I was like, oh, I should start doing that, and there it was, you know. So you can find, I found a lot of um, sort of gang member how they talked. It was great for dialogue, or if you're listening to accents, uh, if you're writing a foreign, uh, accent, uh, British, for example. You can find how, you know, you can just listen to the accent, different words, different things. You get a kind of a, and, a, and you get a visual picture of the people as well. So it was great for dialogue. It was great to see, um, also for young adults, if you're writing, um, say, for teenager, you know, there are different words that kids today use than I, than, you know, teenagers used in my day. Um, you know, these days you say, I'm going to prom. You know, in my day, you say going to the prom. So that was something that I used in um, my Girl on the Brink thing. It was going to prom. Um, you leave out the the. the. Um, so it's it really, um, and that would have been a you know a big mistake. You know, writing for today's teenage audience. Uh, another great thing I found on there was a tour. Um, there was a video of the L.A. County Coroner's Office and um, Department and the morgue. That's a difficult place to get into. Even as a you know a journalist, I couldn't get in there. But it was great. So you just watched this whole thing. You know, some guy explaining you know the process of when a body comes in. You know, the body. You see the body, actual body bag. You see what the, the people are wearing. It was very cold in there, and I noticed all the employees were bundled up under their sort of smocks. They had sweaters on, and the guy says, "Oh, I think they keep it at 45 degrees or something," which you know for obvious reasons. <laughs> But again, a great detail. You know, I used that detail. You know, I have the you know another uh, book I wrote um, that I'm working on. You know, I have the detective telling the people who's going into the morgue to to ID the body. Make sure you put your jacket on. You know, it's cold. So those are you know those tiny little details can really make your story. Um, and then of course they they, they had a, uh, there was another video on how on an autopsy. Now, I don't need, you don't need to describe the whole autopsy thing, but I was able, you know, the Y incision, I have the doctor, the, you know, the pathologist doing a, starting the, the incision, the Y, they do from clavicle to clavicle, and they cut it down, you know, from breast to, to the pubic bone. So I just put that in. And then I have, then I have the detective leaving, and she gets a phone call, then I have her coming back, and now they're jumbling all the organs and intestines back into the body cavity and sewing it up. So there's my autopsy scene. So, you know, you don't need a blow by blow, but it was enough to give it that realistic, um, you know, uh, detail. Um, that's all you need, and then you see the, um, you know, the, the metal things. You know, again, you can get a lot out of watching those kind of videos. Um, another thing I was writing one time was, um, it was about cargo hijacking. 
So I needed to know how you actually, how these, how you actually connect and disconnect the container off the cab of the, you know, the tractor trailer cab. So well, it was on YouTube, you know. So there they go into, you know, how you, you know, you connect with these brake cables and air cables from the tractor trailer cab to the wheels on the, on the uh, container thing, these legs that come down. So, you know, again, I was able to just see how it was done. You don't necessarily need the whole detail, but you know, when it's just useful to have it in your mind so you know what it's, you know, how it's done. So you can sort of see what realistically has to be put in. So I, I highly recommend just looking at YouTube for whatever you're, for, you know, whatever you may need. That's one um, thing. Uh, you know, of course, Google and whatnot. Um, let's see. Memoirs. Memoirs are great resources because they're <laughs> first person accounts. I read a ton of gang member memoirs. There's about half a dozen I found. I got them all, I just read through them. Some of them were applicable to, to what I was writing about, some not so much. But again, it, you just get really saturated with what you're writing about. And if somebody has written about a, mem a memoir about pretty much anything, you know, anything and everything, you can find a memoir. And again, they're great details. Um, I have one um, scene that I took from it, and it, uh, a memoir was, it was about how people shoot heroin in prison, you know, sharpening like a, a pen, um, you know, a, a ballpoint pen, you know, the, the casing, and they sharpen that down and use that to jab the thing in. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty graphic. But anyway, I used that, you know, and I knew it was true because it came out of a memoir about some MA guy who was in, in, in prison. So you can, you know, you can get a lot from memoirs. A little more, um, you know, nonfiction books and biographies are also good, but with memoir you get someone who's putting all their emotional things into it. You get that emotional um, aspect and nuance to it, which is also really good when you're, you know, writing your characters. So I highly recommend looking at memoirs um, as, a, as a way to, to get into, to further your, your character. Um, at the, um, another thing for writing about places, I've lived in a lot of places, so I, tr I try and set things in places I've lived. Um, but sometimes you've visited places and it's long ago, you don't remember, or sometimes you, you, know, you wanna put something in that other place you don't, don't know that well, or maybe passed through, or it just fascinated you. So what I found was Google Earth. There's a couple ways to kind of get, if you look at Google Earth, um, it'll give you kind of a map of the, you know, street scenes of a particular neighborhood. Um, I was writing a short story, um, and it was about, a, it was, had to be set for a contest, and it had to be set in Massachusetts. I went to college in Massachusetts, Boston University, and this um, thing I set in New Bedford, which I'd gone through, but again, it was years ago, I didn't know, you know, remember it clearly. Uh, I knew the vague sort of, you know, how the New England houses look and the East Coast, the houses look a little different than out here and stuff, but I really didn't, you know, I didn't remember. So I went onto Google Earth and I could see the streets and what, you know, was on the corner and that kind of thing. And you can get a really good idea. And again, all you need are a couple key details. The wooden frames. Um, you know, whether they have fire escapes on the outside of the buildings. Um, that's all you really need. You don't need, you know, to describe every brick in the house. You know, so it was really good to do that. Um, and then another thing is just a map. Um, just a regular paper, you know, map and spread it out. I was writing about, writing about um, one of my novels that are still in the proverbial drawer. Um, is set in Caracas, where I lived in Venezuela. So again, I had to think back to what the streets were and what have you, but I got a map and I spread it out and then I was like, oh, okay. So then they would have gone down here and I you know, mapped it. And I, there's one scene where I have the, the character, he's looking for his wife in a hospital. He doesn't know where he, the hospitals are. So I knew the, you know, bunch of hospitals in Caracas, but I, I could map it out on the, map, you know, what the route he would have, what the logical route 
he would have taken from hospital to hospital to hospital, finally ending up at the morgue and where that was. So, you know, old-fashioned maps are really, are really great to, to just, you know, you get your layout. Um, and then the other thing that, that sort of glues, dovetails into all this is Google Images. And when you go into Google Images, there are pictures from everywhere. I mean, the most remote corner of the earth, there will be some images about, you know, from that place. I was writing um, something set in a jungle, and it was in the Venezuelan Amazon jungle in a town. And I've been in jungle, several jungles, and they call much of a muchness, you know, it's very dim. Uh, the light, the tree canopy is so thick, it's very dark and dim. Uh, the, stuff, the heat is very intense, it's very silent, you hear little birds. So I was able to describe all that, and I knew that would be sort of the jungle. I've been in jungle towns and, and whatnot. But I wanted something specific, you know, I had to check what this particular town was. So I went on Google Images, and there it was. I found um, San Carlos de, de Rio Negro, and I saw, I could see the color of the water of the, of the river, um, just a few you know, where the port was, if it was a jetty or it was just boats pulled up on the shore. You know, you just get a few, then again, all you need are a couple of details. And um, so again, doing all the, you put all that together and then you can come up with, you know, writing about a place that maybe you've forgotten about or, or maybe you visited years ago and it's changed. Um, you know, again, it's, it's just an invaluable resource and that wasn't always, um, you know, not, sometimes it isn't that uh, read, you know, apparent. Um, great um, things for me writing historical things are movies and TV shows. You know, if you're set in a period drama, they've done all that research. And it tends to be pretty accurate. And it can be, and again, some of the things you may have lived through but forgotten. Uh, you know, if you watch a, a, a TV show from the 70s, all of a sudden I see, remember those lighters, people would have like cigarette lighters, like heavy things they would put on the table. And it was like a table lighter and you would pick it up and you just had it there and everywhere, you know, there's ashtrays, nobody has ashtrays anymore. I was like, oh yeah, you know, I remember having one of those table lighters in my house. Or a soda siphon, you know, my dad would take those little carbonated thing and stick it in a siphon and a water, and it would make soda, and that was how he made soda water to go with his whiskey. You know, all these like, oh yeah, you know, all these little details that again, if you're writing about a period that may be long ago, or you, you're, you know, you can pick up little things by watching um, period, uh, you know, either TV shows or movies, because it tends to be pretty accurate, and, and, and as well as the dress, um, sometimes the dialogue isn't that good. They tend to put in some, I've noticed some TV shows, put in some modern words, you know, that weren't used back then. But you can pick up those, you know, it can jog your memory. So I, I really find that is a useful thing. Um, you can sit there, what I do sometimes, I sit there with a notebook, and I can just write things down, you know, and um, just things that occur to me as they, they come. Um, but I have a lot of, I tend to have, a, I have a ton of notebooks on my desk, so I have different notebooks for different things, so I, I'm always noting, making my notes. Um, for, if you're writing about science kind of things, I was writing something, and it was um, one of my works in progress, or work in progress, it was about a, a little frog in Colombia. It's, it's native to a very specific section of Colombia, so I had to find out about this frog. So I'm like, oh. So I, I found some, you know, you do the Wikipedia thing and whatnot, but you can find out a lot more uh, from like scientific papers. So uh, there's a site called academia.edu and that has, you can put in a search term and, you, and people will upload uh, academic and scientific papers for free. And, you know, sometimes it's a little dry, maybe too much, much detail that you may not need. But again, it's just a really good way if you're writing about, say, botany or horticulture or, or want some kind of um, specific information about a plant, uh, you know, poisonous plant or something that you're using, you know, that, that can be a resource as well. So uh, look at those scientific papers. Uh, if you go, um, you know, Wikipedia, they'll have a, an entry. 
and then you look at the bottom, and then it'll have the sources. It'll often note the sources that were used to, to write the, the Wikipedia article. So, um, and those can be really use more, sometimes more useful. That'll link you to newspaper articles. When you read the newspaper article, that'll give you the name of an expert, that'll quote the name of some sort of expert. Then you can go to the expert's website. They might be a professor or they'll have a website. So if you follow kind of the trail back, you can get to some pretty cool research, you know, some first-hand research in whatever subject. And, and there's usually, you know, there's a professor who's written a about a paper about pretty much anything, the smallest of, of things. And I found a number of gang researchers, actually, sociologists who study gangs and um, different aspects, girl gangs, and all kinds of aspects of, of gangs on that. And, if, and a lot of professors will have um, on their websites, um, they'll have articles that they've written. So if you find a professor about, you know, say, art history, they might be, you know, look at their website, maybe there's something about forgery or tracking, or, you know, there's something that you can use. It'll be on their website. Um, papers and academic papers or articles, essays, what have you, that they've written. So that's a, that can be a really good way to, to find out about, um, about different things. Um, and you can also even, you know, send them, oftentimes the, the email will be there and phone number of their office. Um, you know, I've sent them people uh, emails saying, you know, I'm writing such and such. You know, I just have a, you know, question if you wouldn't mind answering. I really appreciate it, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes you get, you know, sometimes they ignore you. Sometimes they have no answer. You know, um, I found professors at smaller colleges are more um, likely to answer than, say, at Harvard. <laughs> So, you know, but again, you know, people like to be consulted, you know, that use their expertise. You can say, you know, I'll mention you in my acknowledgments or, or what have you. Um, and you, you know, you never know. You get an answer and it may be something on some specific point that you're stuck on or need an answer on. Um, you know, in that thing, if you're writing sort of detective police things, which are obviously very popular, um, I went to a citizen police academy. Um, I live in Santa Monica, and they had a Santa Monica PD has a, a they call it community police academy. And a lot, most, um, a lot, well, I don't know if most, but anyway, many police departments have them. And they're free. They, you know, police departments offer them. It's like, it was like a 10 week course. And anybody can go, they just checked that I didn't have a felony record, um, and I don't, so I was in, and, um, you know, went with my notebook, and they, you know, it's a great PR tool for the, for the police, but then you do get access to cops, and you can ask them anything, and the chief came, and you can ask her anything, and, and whatnot, so that was a really good resource if you're writing police stuff, is to, you know, go to one of these citizen police academies, um, the FBI has one in LA, I know the LA County Sheriff's Department, probably San Bernardino probably has one. I'm sure there's, there's stuff out there. If you look at their websites, um, sometimes it'll say they're usually called Citizen Police Academies. So that was a really, that's a really good resource if you're writing about police stuff. Um, and, you know, and if you don't have a ready you know, police neighbor who's a police officer or what have you. Because those are also really good contacts. You know, you, Everybody, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows a cop or a lawyer or what have you. Um, but sometimes you don't. Um, for questions of law, I, you know, those are really, when you're looking up, you know, what's a, is it illegal to do this? Or what kind of, you know, weapon is illegal? Uh, I've found law firm websites are real, criminal defense law firm websites are really useful. You just plug in. These days, you can just plug in a question. Is it illegal to own, you know, um, I, I was looking at nunchucks the other day, and I wanted to know if that was an illegal weapon. So I put in that uh, in California, because um, I'm set in California, and then I got my answer. And then I, it was from some criminal defense attorney, and they often have these things, because they're always looking for clients. Um, you know, it'll have a little explanation of California law about nunchucks, and I found that you know, they are legal, but legal if you are a martial arts instructor. So I thought, hmm, that's a good, I thought, oh, I can use that. Because I can make it, 
they arrest my person, arrest my character for having these nunchucks, and then his lawyer comes in with saying, hey, he's a martial arts instructor, so he's, you know, <laughs> off. So I thought, oh, that's a good little, you know, little loophole, you know, make use of the loopholes. Um, so that's cool, and some of these sites have ask a, ask a lawyer, so you just put in some question, and they'll have some lawyer will get back to you. And that's, you know, for free. You know, again, you can ask something like, you know, is it illegal to have nunchucks or you know, whatever. Um, so those are really good things. And you can often just find them by Googling, putting in your, your actual question. Um, you know, is it illegal or, you know, can you have such and such? Um, another thing, uh, you know, books. So you don't, you, you know, obviously there's a library. Um, but Amazon, of course, is the, you know, book repository of, you know, par excellence. So you can go on there, and what I've done many times is just look up a book on, you know, gangs, and this whole bunch will come up. And then you can use the, the look inside uh, feature. And actually some books have quite a few pages listed there. And I've gotten um, quite a few things out of those. Uh, you can just, you know, you skim through, see if they've, you know, you can look in the table of contents, if it's worth going through, then go to the page, and you can look and find, you know, little tidbits uh, about whatever. Or, you, you know, you can see if it's a book worth buying, um, obviously. So that's a really good way to, um, you know, just find stuff as well. Uh, or find experts and quote it in books. Um, and there's also Google Scholar, and um, that's another one that comes up sometimes as well that, for academics. So with all this stuff, and obviously you can Google, you find um, newspaper articles are really great, uh, you know, doing all that, various websites and, and what have you for different, different subjects. Um, so here are the, some, some caveats. So that's how I basically came up with, you know, skin of tattoos. I just did exhaustive research. And plus then I, you know, then you add to it your writer's imagination, your writer's intuition, and, you know, and it, and it starts sort of gelling. And that's how I, I ended up writing about it. Um, I was, I felt particularly good about it. I, I teach creative writing at a prison, Lancaster State Prison in L.A. County. And, um, so I gave the guys one, a copy of the book, and I wondered what they would say about it. Oh, this will be interesting. So, you know, a couple of them, one was a former Crip, he loved it, but it wasn't quite, you know, he, it wasn't Latino. My, my guys are Latino gang members, the, the Salvadoran connection. So one of the guys gave it to a couple guys who were in there convicted, who were, you know, gang members and um, the outside uh, Latino gang members. I thought, and so I got this note back, you know, your book has been cholo approved. <laughs> <laughs> you did a, you did a feed me job. <laughs> you did a great job. So I thought, ah, oh, you know, I was kind of bad. So that was, I, I only wish that could be posted on Amazon. You know, that, you know, but it was kind of, a, you know, because at first he said, the, the guy, he's like, ah, oh, I don't know that dialogue, you know, it's a little bit heavy, but, He's like, and then he came back and said, I knew a guy just like Rico. Rico's the antagonist in the, in the book. He's like, I knew a guy just like him. Okay. You know, so, um, so it was kind of, that was kind of a funny little, you know, epilogue to the, to the book. Um, now with writing what you know, um, you know, I, I lived through a, an abusive relationship with this crazy guy. Um, and uh, so I wanted to write about it. And I felt strongly that it was sort of, as I said, a cautionary tale. I wanted to, to set it for, I wanted to aim it at young adults, to, to, to girls, as they're starting their dating lives, the red flags, the signs, because they're there. But if you don't know the signs of an abuser, you really must, you, you can go way off. You can misinterpret them totally, which is what happened to me. But so I, I had to do my research on that as well. And again, I was into the subject. You know, I really wanted to know what, dynamic behind this. So I read some books, you know, one was about borderline personality disorder, which, you know, that was the person I was involved with. One was a, one was a memoir, one was like a, a sort of a psychology book. I read a book about abusers. 
Um, and all this, you know, I found out, you know, various domestic violence websites and the circle of violence. So it really just confirmed my experience, but I knew, it also just put into place, I knew what I had to put in the book for to, to spell out the sort of the signs. But again, it, my experience was all in that, but it just kind of verified and, you know, sort of validated the whole thing. And then I had to just, you know, I fudged the thing, you know, I had to change certain facts and whatnot. Um, and that was another reason I put it in young adult, because I didn't want to put, um, when you're writing about real people or basing things on real people, you do have to disguise certain characteristics and, and whatnot. So I did research for that as well, you know, but again, it verified and validated that I knew I was on, on track. Um, and just, you know, the things about, you do have to um, change things when you are using real people, you know, physical, uh, physical appearance, any identifying characteristics, tattoos, or, you know, anything, you know, that's very unique to that person, uh, change, the, change the location, uh, the setting, um, age, and profession. Those are the main things you have to change in, um, when you're writing about, you know, basing something on, on the real person, even, even when it's fictional. The key is not to make it recognizable, so, uh, uh, so somebody couldn't recognize them. So here, so, you know, you've done all your research and everything, so there are some caveats. One is, don't let facts stand in the way of a good story. And um, I know many, you know, there are police officers who write, who end up writing detective novels, and they always say this, you know, they you know, go up and you say, you know, I'm really worried about it, you know, this, do, do cops do this or that? And, you know, if your character needs to do something, you know, bend it a little bit. Um, but you can, and sometimes it'll, you know, um, there's a thin line, there's a line between, <laughs> Suspending your dis, you know, asking your readers to suspend a lot of disbelief, and you know, for your and serving your story. Basically, the facts have just served you to serve your story, mm -hmm. not the other way around. But there are, you know, people will pick up on stuff. Um, I was reading a book, um, and I, again, it was a gang novel by this guy. But um, he, he sat in L.A. and he said they were taking a road trip or something, and he said. Well, I'm going to take 405 to 15 to, you know, 210. Like, oh, that's not, you well, know, he's not from LA because that's not how people in California say. So you say to the 405, I'm going to take the 15. So that one little word, sure enough, I went to the back of the book and I say, yes, he's from Virginia. He was an English professor in Virginia. So that one little word, like I said, to prom or to the prom, can mean, you know, is a big difference. You know, but again, his book was acclaimed. It didn't seem to really, you know, matter in the in the in the long run of it. But uh, you know, again, it just kind of triggered my my you know little uh, thing. Oh, he didn't quite know what he was talking about. Then another book um, I read recently uh, by a woman who does live in L.A., but she had a cop pulling out a spiral notebook and making a <laughs> note in a spiral notebook. Now, if you know anything about police procedure, police don't use spiral notebooks. Mm -hmm. They use bound notebooks. So sometimes you can be too, to put too much detail in. And if you don't, you know, if you can put, when in, what I always said, in, in, even when I was uh, a reporter, when in doubt, be vague. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just be vague. You know, there was no real reason why she had to put spiral in. Just, she took out his notebook. So, um, and again, when you, sometimes when you make too many details, you make a mistake on that one little thing, and that takes the reader out of the story and, you know, jol jolts the reader. So, and then the same um, author, she had a woman from Brentwood in Los Angeles going to the Pacific Division of the LAPD to make a complaint. Well, I happen to know that Brentwood is not in the Pacific Division of, a, of the LAPD, it's in the West LA Division. So again, these are very easily verifiable things by looking at the LAPD website. You see the demarcations of which divisions serve which areas of the city. And I just thought, oh, she didn't, you know, and again, it didn't really seem to detract from the book. You know, it got acclaimed, it's up for a big Edgar Award. 
But I just thought, hmm, you know, I, you know, maybe because I was a journalist and you know, you always strive for that extra measure of accuracy and double checking. I'm just like, ah, eh, you know, just it jolted me. And you do get people who will pick up on that little the, that little either leaving in or putting in a the, and they'll, you know, give you a one-star review on Goodreads because she did not put the the in the, you know, uh, in the 405. You get those people. You know, all the time, you know. You know, so, you know, so I try and really strive for accuracy. It's so easy these days, I just stop, and I'll say, okay, you know, is Brentwood in, you know, West LA or Pacific? And you just Google it, and then I just go back to the thing, or, or you can make a note of it and, and go back to it later. But, you know, and again, you know, so authors make mistakes all the time, these little tiny details. But, and, and, and again, most of the time, you know, often they're overlooked, but it does, somebody will notice, I notice. So somebody will notice these little things. And as I say, you know, you'll, you'll get the, then you'll get the nasty reviewer who'll give you, you know, one star because you missed the um, The other sort of caveat is sometimes you can put in too much detail. As I said, you know, the, the, spire, the spiral in the book. I was writing a screenplay about Carlos the Jackal. He was that 70s terrorist, he was operating in Europe, his sort of most infamous crime was he took, he stormed into the 1973 OPEC meeting, uh, OPEC oil minister meeting in Vienna, and took it hostage for several days, you know, because he wanted, you know, I don't know what he wanted, but I forget. But he took it, the, the thing hostage, so I did all my research, I read all these books, I'd actually interviewed his brother in Venezuela, I, you know, was really into this thing, so I had all this research, so when I'm writing this, the screenplay, I had the, the set, you know, as they, the terrorists are storming up the stairs of the OPEC, of the, of the meeting thing, and there's a secretary, sort of a, a receptionist, so I put in whatever her name was, Ann Smith. And then I had this, the name of the security guard who comes rushing down the hall, and I put Joe Blow. <laughs> so I give it to, you know, a screenwriter friend of mine who's a, you know, well screen. Like, yeah, well, you really did your research, in fact, you, you, know, you don't need to put in the receptionist's name or the security guard's name. You know, it's not even necessary. Just put receptionist, guard one. He's like, you know, it was, it was overkill. So you do, you know, run the risk of doing overkill. Like I said, I looked up the, the cargo hijacking thing. I started writing in detail, and I, and I caught myself, I'm like, Need, you know, to put all this detail about putting legs down and just, you know, and this and that. So sometimes you can over, you know, when you do research and you find out all about this stuff, you want to put it all in. So just think, again, you only need a couple key details, and sometimes it's more for your background knowledge than for anything else. Um, I try and limit, I work with the, the principle of three, so three details, you know, about things. That, that's, you know, enough. So you can get carried away with your newfound knowledge and you know put it all in, um, and that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so we don't be vague. Um, yeah, and then you just have to go with it. You know, you go with your gut. And um, you know, as, as writers, we have uh, empathy. You have to have empathy for your characters, even when you don't do their dislikable characters. Um, I always have a lot of empathy for my characters, so you put that in, um, in your imagination. Um, you, you, you know, you bring to it your, your writer's imagination. It goes through that, that sort of food, that processor in your brain, and a bit of intuition, you know, uh, what would be um, likely to be, to be um, in there. In the, um, in the skin of tattoos, that and all, I have him, he got the, my character Mags, he got his GED while he was in a, a pri the prison out in a Youth Authority prison or something, and, and he looks at his diploma and it says New Horizons School or something, New Horizon uh, School. And I, because I thought, oh, well, what would be a likely term for, likely name of a school that they would have for, you know, kids in prison? Lo and behold, I go up, when I go to Lancaster State Prison, where I, I give the class, above the, the, the door of the classroom that the thing, it says, New Horizon School. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, you know, my intuition was spot on, you know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> so, you know, so you use that intuition, you think, what would my, like, be a likely um, thing? 
Um, a few more minutes, so I'll just... Another thing that, um, these are kind of, you know, a little bit out there, but, you know, 12-step meetings, you can get a lot of information from. Um, you can go in, they're open meetings, you sit in the back, and you just listen. Um, and you find out, I mean, there's, you know, the AA meeting, um, you know, they're up there, they're telling their stories, and they're, they're pretty dramatic stories. I got a lot out of, you know, just sitting and listening to alcoholics tell their stories, whether it's about their backgrounds, what they've been through, you know, whatever, their, their journey back to sobriety, um, you know, in any, there's all kinds of 12-step meetings, you know, the AA meetings tend to be big, and again, you don't have, you know, nobody, usually people are pretty friendly, you don't have to be an alcoholic, you can say, you know, everybody knows, you know, a drinker, uh, you can just sit in the back, and you just kind of, just absorb the, the thing, and that can be a great, um, character, you know, a, a character flaw, or character, and then you, you just learn from the, from the, um, from the, the stories. Again, you don't have to use their stories, but you learn, you know, what it's, what it's like, you know, if, that, if you don't know what it's like. Um, another thing um, kind of useful is volunteering, you know, at a different thing, and it can really add um, a different aspect to your story. If you're at a homeless shelter or just, you know, giving out a Thanksgiving dinner on um, Thanksgiving at a homeless shelter or something, again, you see it close up. Um, and, you know, maybe that could be used in something, um, if, if, um, in one of your scenes or whatever. You know, as a writer, you have to be a little bit ruthless. You have to use, you know, you have to use your life and use what's around you and kind of go out and look for it. And it can, but it can really enrich your, both your, you know, yourself personally, but also your writing. Um, so you have to kind of be open to just different, different things. So those are just two kind of out there. Um, things that you can find, um, and you can use, you know, so maybe it's a pet, you know, maybe you're into animals and you go to a pet shelter, but, you know, that could be incorporated into some sort of a story, um, or a character who works at the pet <coughs> shelter, the animal shelter, or whatever. Um, so, that's about it. Um, I guess we can take a break, and, um, and then come back for Q&A, right? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yay! So I'm just really impressed by you. We're going to take a short break, about 15, 20 minutes. Go ahead and also, if you want to, spend some time with Christina, then we'll come back for Q&A. Thank you so much. So what, what's the inside of a prison look like? You know, there, you know, you can find them on Amazon um, or what have you. And, you know, again, you get the, the real view inside these difficult to get in places. And you just, you know, you can get you a, few, a couple of details. So that's, that's another um, thing I've, I've done for a bunch of documentaries. Yes. I've been, I think I've been a member of the club for close to 10 years, and I have never gotten, literally, as many ideas from one speaker ever, because you covered so many different things, and whether I'm working on it or not, you gave me inspiration to go ahead and do other stuff. I just thank you for oh, this thank you broad very much. And broad <laughs> broad. You know, I, I go to many different writers' conferences, and sometimes you go and you hear the same thing over and over, and I think, you know, sometimes you just get one or two things, and it can make the difference. So, if you get all, you know, if you get one or two things out of it, of what I said, great. So, yes. Um, mine is more of a comment. Um, it would not have occurred to me to go to a 12-step meeting to get background information, but one thing it would occur to me to find out is, if you're going to just kind of scope out what they're like and get research done, do check in advance and make sure it's not a closed meeting. Yes, yeah. And some are closed. Most are open, I've found. But yeah. Yes, some are closed. But, and, and also, um, the Al-Anon meetings are good <clears throat> to find out the sort of things that people have to deal with yes. when they're dealing with um, folks who have um, addiction issues. Yes. And that's, that's, that's helpful yes. for just general life as well as writing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you. Rusty. Um, having a journalism background like you do, but not at that level, um, what's, what do you find is the difference between doing heavy <coughs> research for a topic and being called an investigative reporter? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, again, there are similarities. You're investigating a, a topic. You know, usually when you're a reporter, you're investigating a certain thing, and mostly investigative reporting is about following paper trails. So looking, you know, I've done that. You know, you look up court records, divorce records, bankruptcies. Um, you know, you might look up, uh, you know, usually newsrooms have access to a people finder database. You know, if you ever wonder how TV news crews, can, you know, find out where so-and-so is living and they're camped outside their house, because they have these people finder databases, which um, make use of electricity bills, electricity records, which are actually public information. There's an amazing amount of information that's public. It's kind of scary. Yeah, it is. Um, and that's how they find out. You know, you hook in, and then you can find out where the person lived. You know, you can track them through their, you know, to the moving through their electricity bills. You don't have to own, you know, everybody has to have an electricity bill, uh, either renting or owning a, a home. So, you know, it's more of that sort of, you know, nuts and bolts reporting rather than just sort of nuance or, or thing for a, for a novel, you know, you're looking at. So, so did you use any, um, what they call CIs, you know, informers or anything to help you get your information, or it was always you going after you? In, in journalism, as a journalist, or um, <coughs> a novel, or? Yeah, yeah, I mean, sometimes, well, in journalism, yeah, you get tipsters, okay. you know, which could be a CI. You know, somebody will call in, they want to be an anonymous source, they may, you know, now there's a lot of, um, you know, at the AP, we would not use anonymous sources. They had to be on the record, which kind of put us behind the eight ball because other uh, media will use anonymous source, you know. Um, so sometimes that was a real handicap because people don't want to put their name to something that could be, you know, whistleblower type things or dangerous situation, that kind of thing. Um, so, it, you know, it depends on the policy of your media, if you're going to use an anonymous tipster or not, or some, you know, a deep throat, a water date, that kind of thing. And then as, uh, for, you know, my fiction, it's not as sort of high stakes, you know, it's fiction, so it's, it was basically just me. And, you know, again, I would interview people, or, you know, people would tell me different things. So, you know. Yeah, uh, I'm writing a story about uh, resistance, franks, and collaboration, mm -hmm. and so on. And so you mentioned something about that you had uh, been disguised as a nun, and I wondered if you could briefly tell me a little bit about that. Oh, well, that was, that was in Caracas. There was a, a jail um, called in de Catia, and it was a really infamous jail for really horrific conditions. So I was assigned by this human rights magazine to go into that jail to, do, to see what was going on in there. Just these horrific stories came out of this jail. Um, so I applied to the Venezuelan prison department, or whatever it was called. They refused to let me go in there as a, as a journalist, saying they could not guarantee my safety. That was their uh, uh, excuse. So I had to find a way to get in. So I found out. Uh, I forget how I found, but I got somebody put me in contact with a nun who would go in there every week to minister, sort of, you know, just to the inmates and what have you. Uh, she was a Filipino nun, and um, so she said, yeah, I'll take you in, but you've got to, you know, you'll just say you're a nun. So here's a nun telling me to lie. <laughs> but anyway, so she didn't wear a habit or anything. I said, do you wear a habit or, you know, no, I just, you know, she just dressed in street clothing. She just had a wooden cross around her neck. So I just went in with her um, through the, the, through the, you know, so they, we had to be patted down. We, you know, we're taking the women, we're taking the side, um, and we had to be kind of patted down. They unzipped a, the zip and kind of patted around here. Um, so it was a little intrusive, you know. I, you know, the nun did it too, and we went in. <laughs> And so we go in, and I'm, you know, she knew some of the men and whatnot. But I mean, it was a place. It was pretty. It was a lawless sort of a prison, and it was just horrific. I mean, the stench. Actually, waiting in the line outside the prison, you could just smell the, the raw sewage. And, I mean, it just stunk. And you go in, and then eventually you just kind of get used to it. There were prostitutes in the line. The prostitutes go in. I mean, it was just terrible. And you go in. The guards, you know, were kind of on the, they were too scared to go in the actual prison. They were kind of on the outside. But, and the print, and there's no visiting area. You just go into the cell blocks. And I go into the, ca you know, the cafeteria. And I couldn't, of course, take notes. So I have to really remember this because I'm not 
it's supposed to be a report, you know, for journalists. You know, the, the grease on the, in the cafeteria tables, they have these cement some tables and benches, you know, it was just, you know, like the, this thick, um, you know, and some one guy takes me downstairs, he's like, oh, I want to show you something, oh, you know, and of course I, I, you know, I just said I was a visiting nun from uh, the United States, and he takes me downstairs, and there was a broken pipe of water, it was all this, uh, you know, black, uh, you know, wastewater just gushing, you know. And then he says, and he says, yeah, and I gotta, you know, he shows me, I've gotta protect myself. And he turns around, and there's this big shank, you know, we had carved off a leg of the bed, and he just had it down as, you know, well, you know, walked around with his bed leg you know, as his weapon. And I suddenly got like, I'm down here with this guy. <laughs> and I, you know, there's no guard, and you know, I, if I'm gonna, you know, something could happen, I could scream, nobody's gonna hear me. Let's go upstairs. You know, back and, yeah, I was just yeah, it was pretty. But anyway, I got my story, and um, you know, later on, the government did actually just demolish that jail. Um, I have a question. Um, are you doing anything for Associated Press, or did you leave that behind and do it for your own personal writing? Yeah, right now I left the AP, and now I do. Um, you know, I work my fiction, of course, but actually I have to eat. Um, so I do sort of public relations writing, I do corporate communication writing, which sort of pays well. I write speeches for um, executives, press releases. You know, I work for a PR firm, freelance as a contract. And I edit um, dissertations, um, reports, book manuscripts. I've edited a couple of those. So, you know, whatever writing thing comes comes Did you leave the AP because of danger? No, no, I didn't leave because of danger, just because I, I actually got a um, tendonitis in my arms from typing. Yeah, so now I have to kind of baby. I can still type, but I kind of have to take care of my arms. But yeah, mm -hmm. repetitive stress. I have one more question. Um, your book, Girl on the Brink, obviously you talked about it being a, a personal encounter. How hard is that for you to write because of your own vulnerability and being able to share with the world and Need to tell your story, but still exposing yourself. Yeah. Well, one of the things you know, I, I debated whether to write it as a memoir. I just didn't want to write it as a memoir. You know, it was a painful episode. I didn't want to, you know, be judged. You know, when you go through these kind of things, you get judged a lot, and um, you feel like you're going to be judged. It was a shame. You know, you were just ashamed. I was ashamed that I got involved with this guy, and um, so I thought, well, do I really? You know, I just didn't want to put myself out there as a, as a real thing. I was going to have to then put a whole lot of personal thing, you know, why I got involved. In it. And so I went for my fiction route. Um, and yeah, I did, you know, I, get, I went through several versions of it. Um, the one thing good about it is because it, I, I wrote it quickly, you know, I, I, I was able to get through it right quickly because I wanted to get just get it over and done with, you know. So, but it did bring back a lot of stuff. I did write it several years afterwards, but it did bring back, back some from stuff, but I did have the distance of, of some time. But the good thing, part of that was I kind of just pushed through because I wanted to just get it done. <laughs> and be done with it, so. Yeah, so. Anything else? Will you please join me in thanking Christina so much?